So, it's a pleasure to be speaking to the uh, members in the room today and to those joining online on how to optimize guideline-directed medical therapy in heart failure. Uh, particularly, we'll focus on heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. So, these are my disclosures. I received um, consulting fees for device companies. Uh, nothing will be discussed today related to that. And most importantly, I received postdoctoral uh, research fellowship funding from Transform HF for which I remain eternally grateful. So the main objectives for today are to work out how we can sequence and up-titrate drugs which have proven benefit in heart failure, and how we can try and leverage remote care to achieve drug optimization in these patients. So we've seen this uh, slide earlier today. It's the Canadian guidelines um, chaired by Dr. McDonald to my left, and shows the four pillars of heart failure therapy at the top with uh, ACE inhibitors or ARNI therapy, beta blockers, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists or MRAs, and finally SGLT2 inhibitors. So these are the four foundational therapies, and they provide benefit to our patients. You can see here from a network meta-analysis uh, published by the Norwegian and Singapore groups uh, earlier this year that shows the additive benefit of each of these therapies. If you look right at the bottom, you look at placebo and the effect at unity. And as you get further to the left, that's a further reduction in one-year mortality in patients who are, who are prescribed these therapies. So you can see digoxin has no mortality benefit. And as you work your way up with ARB, ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, and then in uh, combination, you see a sustained uh, improvement in outcome. Right at the top, we have the ARNI, or the Sucubitral Valsartan, beta blocker, MRA and SGLT2 inhibitor, which gives over a 60% reduction in mortality at one year. So these treatments are really efficacious. Another way of looking at them is actually what happens if you don't prescribe patients' medicines. So this is another meta-analysis that was done by the Imperial College Group, published back in, I think, 2017. And what they show here on the left-hand side is the annual mortality for patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. It's around 10%. If you defer addition and uptitration of an aldosterone antagonist demonstrated in orange in the second column, there's a 3% annual risk of death. If you defer beta blocker with that, that's the green, you now have a 7.5% increased risk of death, so 17%. And if you defer an ACE inhibitor, they didn't look at ARNIs at the time, but ACE inhibitor ARB, you get a composite 12% increase in mortality per year. So something where one in 10 patients would die a year, you now have one in four patients dying every year if you don't prescribe therapies. So we have all these therapies that provide efficacious treatments for our patients, but despite everything we do, our patients aren't receiving them. Why? Dr. Harriet Van Spoor spoke about some of the barriers to prescribing guideline-directed medical therapy in the previous talk but it's a combination of factors. And my favorite answer is when you ask any cardiologist, particularly heart failure cardiologist, how do you feel you do in your practice? And, and I am the same, I'm, I'm excellent, I'm the best. It's everyone else who's not doing it. But when you look at uh, cross-sectional studies, and this is from the CHAMP HF registry, which enrolled over 3,000 patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction in clinics in the US, you actually see just how poor we are at prescribing these therapies. Again, looking on the extreme left-hand side, you can see with ACE inhibitor or ARB prescription, only around 60% of patients are receiving these prescriptions, and around four in 10 patients, the red part of the bar, are patients not receiving the medicine and don't have a documented contraindication. There's a very small amount at the bottom who have a definite contraindication. When you get to ARNI, again, this was published in 2018, and the numbers might be a little bit better, but still only one in eight patients were prescribed in AR and I. Looking f the far right-hand side, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists on the graphs that you've seen previously today, the most efficacious of treatments in heart failure, still only one-third of patients are being prescribed these medicines. So whatever we're doing, we're not doing it properly, and we need to do it better. So what's the solution? Well, the first thing is the easiest way of making something more difficult is by adding another group of treatments. So we saw three before, now we have four foundational therapies. I'm going to ask uh, members of the audience. I'm going to start with one of the panel members because it's easiest to pick on people closest to me. But Dr. McDonald, I'm going to ask you, in your clinic, how many titration events do you think you'd need for a, an average patient? 
So, so how many visits or contacts do you need to get yeah. them? Uh, oh, geez, off the top. Um, you know, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, something like that. Seven. And how frequently would you be able to get patients in to titrate them? Well, there's what we tell people and what we do. So we, we tell people to try and do this every couple of weeks, but more like, um, usually it's usually a month or... So that's going to be six or seven months yep. to get patients the treatment. Uh, I'm going to pick on Dr. Alex Ova uh, after a wonderful talk this morning. Can I ask the same question to yourself? How many visits and how frequently do you think you manage? Seven, eight visits again, more or less? Probably, you know, uh, seven or eight visits, probably uh, for some patients who are very good and we figured out a way for them to up titrate remotely, we do that, but that is, again, not the Okay, standard. so it's going to take around six months again. Uh, three to six months, but... Anyone else in the audience who has different numbers? Dr. Hussain. Three months, three it visits. Takes, it takes the clinic staff, you know, and my availability. Yes. In other words, I believe that it can be done. I, don't, I can't do any faster than that. Okay. So th what we find is that most people struggle. This is a typical patient who's been referred, who's on 1.25 of Ramipril, 2.5 of Bisoprolol, and we'll start up titrating them. Well, actually, we'll, we'll put them twice daily for the Ramipro, one visit. We'll give them something else. Uh, I don't know, maybe some more ACE inhibitor. 3.75 because they've got low blood pressure. We'll go to five, so that's now three visits. Oh, we'll go to seven and a half, four visits. Top dose, so now they've hit maximum ACE. That's five visits so far. Double their beta blocker, six visits. Add in a, a small dose of spironolactone, a little bit more beta blocker, more spironolactone. An SGLT2 will go in at half dose, increase the beta blocker, increase the SGLT2. So that's 13 visits we've done for this one patient. Even if you do that every two weeks, that's still six months. And we never quite up titrated the MRA because they had high potassium, et cetera. So people have suggested, actually, yes, do rapid sequencing. Uh, Milton Packer, John McMurray, godfathers of heart failure treatment suggest, actually, rather than going in the historical sense where the ACE inhibitors were done in, what, 1987, the trials came out, the beta blockers came out around the turn of the century, uh, Rails was in the late 90s. Rather than going in a historical sense, start with a beta blocker, start with SGLT2. A week or two later, start the ARNI and then go with a mineralocorticoid receptor. Again, you do that, the pack away. That's still start with that. Keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. Make sure the patient turns up. Make sure you don't go on holiday. Make sure you don't have any uh, service weeks where you can't see patients in clinic. And you can see that still takes 11 shots. That's still going to take every two weeks, 22 weeks to achieve target. That's not really ideal. Because we know that everything we do improves the outcomes of these patients. And some of our Australian colleagues said, actually, is it just too complicated? Should we just stop trying to worry about how we titrate medicines? And is it just too complex? We heard a little conversation earlier about maybe you should just get patients on limited doses of meds and everything should be OK. And the jury's probably split on this. So if you go way back to 1999, the uh, Atlas HF study, uh, again, Philip Paul Wilson, uh, a godfather of heart failure in the UK, Milton Packer, John Cleland, all the big names, what they did was randomize patients in low-dose ACE inhibitor and high-dose ACE inhibitor. And what they found at the end of the trial, that patients on low-dose ACE inhibitor did not have excess mortality compared to those on high-dose uh, ACE inhibitor. But when you looked at the composite endpoint of heart failure, hospitalization, and mortality, those in the higher dose group were protected from being hospitalized with heart failure. So actually getting to good doses does matter in these patients. Another study presented recently, I think a, a sub-study of the PROVE-IT trial, looked at real-world evidence in patients treated with an uh, Entresor, with an ARNI. And it's quite a complicated graphic, but at the top line are patients in the lowest tertile of treatment 
The ones in the middle are in the middle tertile, and the ones at the bottom are the highest doses. And the mean dose for the top group is around 112 milligrams per day, so just over low dose uh, sucubitral valsartan. In the middle group, it's somewhere around 342, so very close to maximum dose. And the last group, it's somewhere near 379 uh, milligrams. And it shows that actually the drop in NT pro BNP is not significantly different from groups. The improvement in the echo parameters is not significantly different between groups. So maybe getting a patient onto a low dose of an ARNI is more beneficial than trying to pump it up and start other therapies at the same time. And there's lots of ways of trying to get onto the right therapy. We can see here a, uh, a titration plan set out in paper by one of the Australian groups. Again, it's quite complicated, and it's a lot of involvement of clinic team and clinic staff, much as Dr. Hussain said earlier. But we come back to this. Despite efforts, we still aren't getting the right medicines into our patients. So what can we do better? Well, maybe technology can help. This is the central illustration from a trial published earlier this year called the Prompt HF study. And what this did was use a cluster randomized uh, trial design where individual physicians had their EHR, the electronic health record, uh, programmed to assess patients' history, their ejection fractions, the medicines they were on, their vital signs, and their laboratory results. And some providers were given alerts suggesting that medicines could be uptitrated, and others had usual care. And you can see from the interaction, in the interaction, the intervention arm in the dark blue, that more patients received uh, more heart failure therapies, more classes of heart failure therapy of GDMT than in the control arm. It's again better shown here. On the top, we're looking simply at classes of GDMT. Within 30 days, there was about a 7% absolute increase in the prescription of all, GDM all GDMT classes in the intervention arm. When you look at dose increases and starting of new therapies, that's the bottom graph, you see that there is a significant increase, nearly 10%. So if you prompt clinicians to do the right thing, if you support them in doing the right thing, they're really willing to do the right thing. So we need to work out solutions to, to improve prescription of these medications. And there's a whole series of work, uh, Stanford are one of the leading groups where they look at uh, behavioral design, how we can get people to do the right thing. You remember when the COVID restrictions were then, we had those two meter lines on the floor and people would automatically stick to those. That's a simple way of persuasive technology trying to improve behaviors. And we can do that in healthcare too. So that's the website, have a look, it's very interesting. But can we take it a step further? How can we use perhaps remote technologies to help us in achieve our goal? So. I'm going to try and show the results of a study we undertook at Toronto General Hospital. We randomized patients to remote titration of their medicines and others to usual care. In the remote titration arm, patients who were enrolled in a remote monitoring system, the Medley system, which had their vital signs measured and patient symptoms measured, were sent to a nurse coordinator, and every two weeks they would send an email to the physician treating them saying, hey, these are their uh, current medicine levels, these are their blood results, would you like to change any of their uh, therapies? They would make a decision, a go, no go signal essentially, and then the nurse coordinator would put that into action. We compared that with usual care, which was patients coming to clinic visits uh, on an ad hoc basis as per usual physician schedules. And the results are fairly impressive. Looking at the top line alone, you can see those in remote titration achieved uh, the target 98% of the time, whereas only 84% of the usual care did it. In terms of optimization, it took about four months for remote titration compared to six months in usual care. And this is at one of the best performing heart failure centers in the world. So if it takes six months in usual care there, that's the best we're gonna hope for. The BNP wasn't different after titration. These medicines didn't work more efficaciously, they just worked earlier. And the same with the LVF, there was about a 10% increase in LV function at the end of it. Most importantly, you can see the total number of heart failure clinic visits was reduced from 3.7 down to 2.2, which is a significant reduction. And that reduced the number of time the patients have to come into Toronto, pay $25 for parking fees, waste half a morning, and lose earnings. And here's a Kaplan Mica, which again shows in real stark contrast how the uh, remote titration group reached target much more quickly. And the key thing to look here is in the blue graph on the right hand side, 25% of patients were not completing titration after one year in usual care. And there are lots of factors and we can explore that later, but here we can see how digital health technologies can help. 
So the final thing I'll raise is, can we take it one step further still? How about we take much of the human contact out of it? Perhaps we can have auto-titration algorithms where patients put in their parameters, and it's set by their physician saying, if the blood pressure is above 90 and the creatinine is less than 150, just keep going. Increase the, the prescription of medicines. So we don't need to wait for people to make decisions because the decisions are already pre-made. How about we empower the patients? We teach them in advance that actually you have heart failure. We need to get you on these treatments. If we defer the treatments, you'll have a higher chance of being hospitalized. The patients are the greatest partner in achieving the, uh, the, the, the end game for us in getting patients on good therapy. So why don't we empower them? There's lots of things in this space, and I'm not going to say too much more because I've run out of time already. But thank you very much for listening, and I'll answer questions during the panel session at the end.